The life of the Jerusalem first century scribes to which Jesus is referring in this passage might have been a lot like the characters on how to get away with murder. Over the centuries, the scribes had morphed from simple secretaries to the position where they had become the arbiters of God's law between the people and the temple. Scribes were the antecedents of many current professors, authors, playwrights, and especially, please forgive me, and this is Annette, attorneys. Scribes were the ones who made deals through which surviving female spouses and orphans who committed the unclean sin of simply surviving their husband and father's demise were made clean enough to re-enter the temple at huge expense. These spouses and orphans had stories a lot like the ones that you hear on the Moth Radio Hour, but nobody in first century Jerusalem cared to listen to them. However, Old Testament scriptures repeatedly warn of God's displeasure with the unfair treatment of widows and orphans. Job 22, uh, 9 laments, You have sent widows away empty-handed, and the arms of the widows you have crushed. Psalms 94, 6 laments, You proud, kill the widow and the stranger. You murder the orphan, and you say, God does not see. Isaiah, the first chapter, the 16th and the 17th verse commands, Make yourselves clean, rescue the oppressed, Defend the orphan, plead for the widow. As the first century scribe had become part of the systematic money machine. Money greased the hands of the temple officials, and money greased the hands of the Romans, and of course, money greased the hands of many ambitious scribes. The temple decreed that widows had to be financially negotiated back into God's good graces, and the scribes, the writers, or the interpreters of the law were just the people to do that for the widows, but at huge cost. The widows could come back to the temple, but only if they surrendered all of their property, what they had to live on, what they had to live in, to the interpreters of the law, to the scribes. The temple saw a way to make money on the widows and the orphans in the sanctimonious <coughs> probate court, taking money that never made it to God. The widows and the orphans were being murdered. In the scripture that Annette read to us this morning, Jesus said they were being devoured. Now, in last week's text, Jesus had shown us that all attorneys or scribes were not evil. If you remember, last week we had met a scribe who had come along asking Jesus intelligent questions about the greatest commandment. If you remember, the scribe even declared that love was more important than temple sacrifice. But the scribes against whom Jesus warns were the ones wearing the long robes and parading about in Luke and also in Matthew. Uh, it said they had broad phylacteries on their Bibles, which are long cloths, so that as they walked along their Bible, the cloths on their Bibles dragged the ground. And they were praying pretentious prayers in the streets. You might say that these scribes were the ones who invented commercials. Vulnerable widows and orphans needing assistance would hear these long, flowery prayers of these scribes standing on street corners and probably think, oh, he's good. That's the one I need to get to represent me at the temple. Having no idea what they were getting into. And because they wanted to be right with God, realizing that they had no choice. This morning's story of unscrupulous scribes is juxtaposed against the story of a widow contributing two coins so worthless that only together did they make up a penny. She dropped them into the temple coin slot. Why? 
most likely because she had given everything she had and she was not deemed worthy enough or even clean enough to go into worship. And yet marginalized, marginalized, she continued to worship God with what she had. Even though Jesus formally started uh, uh, his church by saying uh, that upon Peter the rock, I will build my church, the church is an outgrowth of the temple. The church worships in many of the same ways as did and as does the temple. Even though for a while Christ's church was very powerful, 2,000 years later, because of our actions in many ways, Christ's church is itself marginalized. Religious author and hymnologist and professor Dr. Ruth Duck, uh, maybe some relation to our dear Hallie, reminds us that since the early 1800s, a large portion of the American population is largely unchurched. Realtors can often get more money for a home if said home is not near a noisy church that gets out late at night sometimes and doesn't have adequate parking. Neighbors in bedroom communities watch the church with a suspicious eye. Why? Look at the church's history. The first century church started out saying that everybody, everybody, according to the Apostle Peter, was welcome to Christ's church, and all they had to do was be justified by faith in the risen Savior. Everybody was welcome. That's all. But then, being humans with control issues, as Christ's church became more powerful, and it did become very powerful, the church plunged into a history of holy wars and crusades, inquisitions, colonization, taking lands all over the world from the world's indigenous people. Unless you are a Native American, each one of us in this room is an immigrant. Racial conquests, racial divides, segregations. Uh, Christ Church led the faith-filled truth when it came to hating people for whom they love. Is there any wonder that so many people no longer believe that there is a mystical, heavenly relationship between church attendance, between church giving, and God's grace? Rather than the community striving to get into the church's good graces, the church finds itself in the tenuous, uneasy position of having to now prove itself to the community. The church is not always thought of as trustworthy. The church can no longer keep a straight face as it devours widows' houses. The church can no longer get away with murder. In fact, unless we remember Jesus' promise that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church, the church often seems in danger of being murdered itself. How can the church be God's messengers to people who are no longer interested in the church's confusing message? How do you and I as the church survive our own murder. Well, first of all, we have to decide what our message is. Are we all really willing to make everyone welcome? Are we? Then we must confess our own collusion and complicity in centuries of the murdering of somebody else's faith journey. Sometimes we still do that by simply refusing to let people in. Sometimes we still do that by seeing a wrong and failing to get involved. Oh, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to stir the way, so I'm not, going to, I'm not going to say anything. As God's people, we have to confess that our needs to keep our memories so sacred to keep the way we do things the same 
at the expense of the outside seeker is killing us. I said earlier in the service that the little white chapel uh, is inheriting a piano. And it is uh, coming from a church. Uh, the piano is being completely reworked for us. But it's coming from a church that admittedly decided that it did not want to change its ways to welcome the neighbors who moved in around the church. And the church went from 1,100 members to six. Oh, wow. But our past memories are important. They define who we are. I told you at the beginning of the service when Tracy played Love Divine, All Love's Excelling so beautifully, it took me back. I don't want to give that up. That is part of what defines how I get to God. It defines how I stay with God. But my memories lead me to the second part. How do I make room for other people who seem so different from us, who seem so different from me, and yet honor my own precious memories at the same time? We do it by learning to listen. Learning to listen. I have a dear friend with whom you cannot share a story with without him having to share a story about himself. And I asked the uh, service last night if they knew anybody like that, and all 29 of them raised their hands. You can never ask a question, the person that I'm talking about, he never asks a question about what you said. He answers anything that you say with, oh yeah, that happened to me, and when that happened to me, I did such and such and so and so, which led me to do so and so and so and so, and then I did so and so and so and so, and then I, and you went, wasn't I talking about me? <laughs> How is that welcoming anybody into God's house? How is that not the marginalized, you and I, the murdered, doing more murdering? No, you and I need to learn to shut up and listen for clues. And not just listen closely, but also listen appreciatively. And not just listen politely or appreciatively, but listen with the notion and the intent that you and I will learn something that you and I did not know about living as we listen to somebody else's life, as we let them have the last word. And let that thing that they teach us become an honored part of who we are finding a way to join in saving them, and in the meantime, you and I are being saved. You and I are surviving murder. The widow putting in two coins to make a penny had by society's standards been murdered. Nobody cared about her anymore. The scribes had killed her. No radio show would be telling her story. But some way, somehow, she had been lowly listening and God's grace had touched her when somebody told her that the way to go with God, the way to go where God was going, was to be about helping somebody else with what you had. And so with all that she had, she refused to die. She went with God. May it be so with